Welcome today. We have a special guest, Rand Fishkin, who is the Wizard of Moz. If you know anything about SEO, you probably know something about Rand. He's a true visible expert within the field, well-known, well-regarded, uh, and the founder of what was originally SEO Moz and now is called Moz. So we want to talk today a little bit about how he became a visible expert and the process uh, to kind of illustrate how it sort of works. And then later on, we'll talk a little bit about Moz and, and what you do and how you help professional services firms. So let's start with how in the world did you get involved in becoming an expert on SEO? What was your trajectory? Uh, so I, I dropped out of college in 2001. Always and a I good was, start. Yeah, that's right. Very... Uh, very safe bet there. Uh, and I, I was designing and building websites for um, for the clients of my mom's small marketing firm. Uh -huh. She had a you know solo entrepreneur business where she'd been helping folks with marketing, letterhead, uh, uh, logo design, business cards, that kind of thing, Yellow Pages ads for uh, the 20 years prior, since 1981. So you might and, be like genetically inclined to be a marketer, huh? Yeah, something like that, something like that. Um, and so I was, you know, building websites, and our clients at the time were really struggling to get traffic to those sites, and they didn't have budgets for advertising, and so it turned to SEO. And we at first subcontracted some of that work, uh, but the subcontracting was expensive, and it didn't always work out. And so I started learning to practice myself um, and trying to help our clients, and that learning process uh, became a blog that I began for just kind of personal sharing reasons, right? Mm -hmm. I, I had been doing a lot of sharing and learning through online forums and then the comments sections of other sites. This is the pre-social media era. Yeah. And so started this SEO Moz blog where I could write about what I was finding and what was working and wasn't working. And that, that blog really took off. It got a lot of traction and attention. Uh, over its first, probably in year two, three, four of its operation, first year, not so much. Yeah. Um, but that uh, that led to invitations to conferences. It led to articles in mainstream press. Um, it led to a lot of you know links and traffic and and of course search engine rankings uh, and a lot of RSS subscribers. And I think that's what kind of brought visibility to uh, to Moz and to me initially. When did you start to blog? What year would that have been about? Two thousand three. Two thousand. So a couple of years after doing you know web design development stuff. Uh huh. Now I know that one of the things that uh, you've talked a lot about to people is that you have to let these techniques work for a while. You have to give them enough time to develop and so forth. So. Uh, and I know a lot of people who are thinking about becoming a visible expert and trying to find their way, they get impatient. They try something. So what, what level of patience do you need to have to make a blog develop? I mean, what I, what I have traditionally told folks, and um, you know, I've spoken at a number of events specifically for bloggers and said, you should expect that your first two years are going to be nothing but learning to ride a bicycle. It's not uh, that. That's not a time when you're going to be, you know, um, traditionally cranking out content that gets tons of attention and and links and all of these people looking at you. That's that's the training ground. And I think what happens is that folks who, in their first couple of years, find a little bit of success and find that they have the passion and the patience to stick with it, mm -hmm. can build something really special. And the vast majority are going to drop out and say, hey, you know what, blogging is not necessarily for me. And I think that's actually a really healthy, good thing. Mm -hmm. If you find that something is not your strength, I, I, don't, I don't know that you should focus on it, right? You should double down on the strengths that you do have, on the passions that you have, because I rarely see marketing success, almost never see marketing success from someone who says, yeah, I'm really good at this, but I hate doing it. Right, <laughs> right, not, you know, not going to happen. how it goes. Yeah. 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 What, what did you see as the early signs that kind of told you, hey, this is really picking up, this is going to be something? I mean, I might want to devote my career to this. 
Um, <laughs> so I, I think I had an addiction to um, optimization, right? And the optimization practices mm -hmm. long before there was ever SEO. Um, you know, I love games like Tetris, where you you know you align the bricks and get try and get them just perfect. right. Yeah, 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 right. And I and I was the, I was the kind of guy who would be happy to um, take on a project and and do it until I could get it just exactly right um, mm -hmm. and and find that that fit. So I think that that passion um, was much earlier than my SEO work, but certainly with with the blog and with publishing and um, uh, with sharing, I think that is something in the first, probably right around 18 months, mm -hmm. uh, I was, I remember that there were a few other, what, what we now call very small blogs in the, uh, in the SEO industry, you know, pr probably didn't have more than a thousand visits a day, something like that. Uh, but I, I thought the world of these folks, right? I thought that they were just incredible and, and, and amazing. And a few of those uh, authors mentioned SEO Moz, talked about work that I had done, and the feeling, you know, the, when you wake up in the morning and you see that someone has posted about you um, was really addictive for right. me. And I think that's what led me to say, I'm not going to give up on this, right? I'm going to, I want to keep producing things that other people find valuable. Um, right. I like to say I have a, you can't quite see it, but I've got a giant hole in my chest. Uh -huh. It's not a visible hole, but, but there's a big hole there and it can only be filled by the praise of people, you know, from, from email and Twitter and, and Facebook and LinkedIn and Google Plus. And, and uh -huh. if, if it gets empty, then I have to go out and produce good stuff so that uh -huh. people will like it and tell me that I'm good enough again. Yeah, because that's, I that's just, your content hole. <laughs> yeah, I, I just can't seem to convince myself of it. And so I need constant refreshing. Uh-huh. I see. Well, stay out of therapy. Whatever you do, it'll ruin your career success. <laughs> I, I actually, I've been to therapy. Still can't cure the hole. So I think I'm, I've got a permanent condition. It's a permanent um, hole. Huh? Yeah. Um, now you have, you know, you've really uh, doubled down and, and really been very much involved in educating people, telling them no secrets, telling them how to do it, telling them the whole work. And I know a number of people are kind of concerned about like, well, what if I give away the secret sauce? You know, will yeah. people still come to me? Will they work with me? What, what's your experience has been? How did that work? Um, so I've seen this actually in a huge number of fields now, and I think the pattern is pretty consistent, which is those who share openly and transparently, who uh, are authentically willing to give away all of their secret sauce, find that they have more business, you know, better jobs, better prospects, more respect uh, than those who keep it secret. Mm -hmm. And it's not a universal truth, but close to it. Uh, particularly in the world of publishing and, and, and of content creation and content marketing. I think that's because sharing openly and transparently garners a lot of respect and it, it doesn't, um, it does not get a lot of people what I'd call, you know, stealing your tactics or abusing them or making them uh, less valuable. There's short-term stuff like that, or historically there has been in the SEO field. Right. But um, I think for those who are looking to build long-term businesses, there's not a lot of secrets. There's just a lot of hard work and a lot of challenging topics and a lot of um, you know rabbit holes that you can go down that expose you to opportunities, but also risks. And and that sharing that stuff is more likely to make people want to work with you than it is to make people want to say, oh, great, now I don't have to now, now I don't hire me. Yeah. You know, that's very interesting, and it's something that our research really demonstrates that one of the biggest things people, besides other people saying someone's an expert, one of the biggest things they judge someone as an expert is they can explain something that's complicated. They can explain it simply so you can understand it. And I think that's a really talent that you have. Did you, did you always have that talent, or is that something that you've had to really work on or hone? Um, I think maybe I had a small amount of it, uh, but like everything else uh, in this field and in my life, it's it's a ton of practice, right? At this point, you know, a decade and a half of practice. I would. I, I totally agree. By the way, with that uh, assessment and that research, right? I've seen the same thing over and over again, which is people who can 
simply, reliably, incredibly explain something um, are going to get a ton of trust. And those who say that, you know, that's my secret sauce or I can't share or who simply can't give that yeah. cogent, coherent, um, consistent explanation are, well, not receiving the same yeah. trust benefits. And that's true in every field. Yes. So what are the what were some of the things that you did uh, early on as you were building Moz uh, to get your content out there and share it? We talked a lot about blogging and putting it in there. What other kinds of things did you do? Um, I think a few things were, were pretty successful prior to the social media era and then certainly post social media, I'll talk about that too. But um, some of the first things that I did were to uh, engage a tremendous amount, and and I was you know addicted even before I started my blog in the forums and blog comments and mm -hmm. um, you know a anywhere that a discussion could take place in the in my field on the web, um, you and that there. that built up relationships between me and you know fifty sixty other bloggers writers contributors. Um, it meant that you know, sort of my name and my picture were recognized by people who spent time in those places. Uh, and I think that familiarity also built trust and credibility. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I did a lot of, um, even early in my career, after I started getting invitations to speak was, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of our budget, which we, we didn't have much, right? I would take the cheapest flight I could find, stay in the crummiest hotel I could find yeah. so that I could attend an event or speak at an event and give a presentation because that, that in-person connection uh, created even more trust and credibility and being able to, you know, be there and then write about the other speakers who've been at an event and meet people in the bar afterwards. Um, those were really powerful experiences right. for me and I think right. powerful for amplifying Moz as well. Yeah, very, very, uh, consistent, other, very consistent with what we found. Yeah, I think, you know, you, there's something special about meeting in person that even with all of the things that the internet can do uh, in terms of connecting people, it, it can't create the same kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and people are just so much more willing to help you and go out of their way for you once they've met you in person. Uh, that's true for me, and I found it to be true for a lot of other people, too. Right. Although there are um, those people that you meet, once you meet them, you're not so interested in helping. <laughs> we don't, I, I don't know any of those people. <laughs> no, I, I, yes. Um, and look, hey, if in person is not your thing, right? Like stay in the basement and stay on the internet, leverage your strengths, right? If in person yeah. is not your strength, that's totally okay. I think, I think um, that's and I will well, say, well put. Speaking of that, one of the things that uh, that you've become very well known for is your whiteboard Fridays, uh, and uh, complete with uh, you know all the illustrations and so forth. Can you tell me a little bit about how they started and what it sort of turned into? Sure. Yeah. So I think we were seven people at the time um, at Moz, and, and one of the folks that we had recently hired, uh, Scott, he had some questions about how, in particular, a 301 redirect works. And so I was, I was kind of explaining and diagramming on a whiteboard, like this is how you, know, you redirect a page from, a, from one place to another, and this is what multiple hops means, et cetera. And uh, Scott said, hang on, let me, let me grab our video camera. I'll take a video of this, and we'll, we'll try and turn it into a blog post, see if anyone likes it. And we did, we put it up on, I think we put it up on a Friday, but we didn't actually call it Whiteboard Friday. And then that got a little bit of attention and we had some fun filming it. So we did it the next week and it became a, a tradition really, really fast. I think it was um, maybe one of the first regular video series in the web marketing field. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, when we built our, our next new office, we actually built a room specifically for filming Whiteboard Friday. So we got the lights and the pan, you know, sound panels. Mm -hmm. uh, we invested in some better camera technology. And so you can see the evolution as it gets more and more professional and higher quality. Uh, and that, you know, t it turned into a content format that um, a lot of people liked. One of the weird things about it, though, and I think this speaks to the topic we discussed before of kind of that training ground. Mm -hmm. One of the weird things about Whiteboard Friday is on average for the first, 
I think three or four years that we were doing those videos, they performed, uh, they did not perform as well as the average text blog post. So they were, uh. they did worse than that. Uh, which might lead you to say, hey, let's not invest in this anymore, right? Okay. Let's let's stick to, you know, text and pictures and illustrations and like we're good at that. We're getting more traffic with those. The Swipeboard Friday thing isn't working as well. Um, but we, we felt very strongly that there was a more powerful connection created through video mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that that different kind of um, that different kinds of learners and different types of folks would find it more valuable and were finding it more valuable. And so we stuck with it. And now Whiteboard Friday is one of our top performing content formats. Ah, and so uh, how, give us, can you give us some sort of sense about how popular it is? How many hits you get? Uh, yeah, so let's see, I think the average Whiteboard Friday is watched by between Ten to fifteen thousand folks mm -hmm. uh, over, you know, m the vast majority of those. I'd say probably half of those are in the first couple of days, and then there's kind of a long tail uh, over the next six months. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, you know, continue to rank well in search engines and and get, you know, a few hundred visits uh, a week, and some of them are more like a few dozen w visits a week. But um, right. yeah, I think. I think that that ten thousand visit number is about. That's a nice about, number. That's yeah, a nice number. Yeah. Uh, well, well especially things, for B two B, you know, B two B software world. Yeah. Um, you know, in a consumer, I think in a B two C kind of consumer world or or a major publisher, that wouldn't garner a lot of attention. But in our world, uh, that's pretty significant. Big deal. Yeah, it's yeah. a big deal. Well, one of our hobbies here at Hinge is trying to predict. Uh, how tall your hair is going to be in the next Whiteboard Friday. Right, and, sure. Uh, talk, talk to me a little bit about the, the beard and the evolution of the hair. And Has viewership gone up as the hair has? Or I mean, uh, I'm kind of out of this game. Well, what, so I, <laughs> that's one of those uh, correlation, not causation things. I see. <laughs> uh, no, let's see. I um, Well, I'll start with the, the mustache. I think that's that's the story that's most interesting. I made a, uh, a deal with our team just a little over a year ago that uh, basically when we, when Moz got back to being profitable, I would shave my mustache. I would, I would trim it off, uh, go back to a regular beard. But uh, we are, I think we're cash flow positive, but not, uh, uh, you know, full accounting numbers. Mm -hmm. GA, so uh, uh, principles we'll, we'll know when it's happened huh? yes so <laughs> i'm hoping you know by the end of this year i'm hoping to be able to trim it off but uh it, it works surprisingly well well the I, hair I, thing I is noticed just... you uh, you managed to get in a few of your mustache wax uh oh, examples sure. for yeah. seo yeah that's right well you know i've been i i'm a big fan of what uh, the beard brand guys have done with their marketing and so uh I had to have to give them a shout out a couple times. Yes. Well, so tell us a little bit about how this has helped uh, Moz. Your uh, you becoming kind of this expert in the field and your visibility. What what has it done for the firm and and where where has it brought the firm? Started uh, helping out your mom and where has it taken it to? Yeah, um, I think that the the visibility that. You know that I have personally, and also the visibility of the Moz content platform, and the you know the many other experts that that that's helped give visibility to. Right, uh, uh, Dr. Pete, I think, is certainly one of those. Right, Pete Myers out of Chicago, who who writes for us and, and is a consistent contributor. Mm -hmm. um, Jen Lopez, who runs our our social media community. Uh, Cyrus Shepard, who's one of our uh, who runs our content team. Right, and these folks have become experts in their own right in the field as well. I think that platform is tremendously powerful. Mm -hmm. um, it is a, uh, you know, just like anything else, it's a trust that you establish with your audience and one that is challenging to maintain and easy to break. And so I think that, that for us over the past decade, right, it's been a um, a constant reflection and a constant um, investment of effort to maintain that audience, to maintain that trust, 
to uh, continue to grow the brand and to grow the value that we're providing. I, I, you know, I was think I've been thinking about this for a while now that that what content marketing really is when it's done successfully, content marketing is really about helping people. Mm-hmm. It's less content marketing and it's more let me help you marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. At, at least when it's uh, education or um, information focused as opposed to maybe entertainment focused, which right. I suppose would be another one. But um, for us, you know, we try and say, we try and put marketers first and, and helping marketers to succeed, to do better marketing is our primary mission, right? And that's where, that's what we approach our content with rather than how can we attract the right people for our sales funnel so that we can convert them to a free trial of our software, or mm-hmm. whatever it is. We just say, hey, that that is it's not that it's not important, but we don't need to think about it when we're creating content, when we're making the blog better, when we're you know doing our in- industry survey, when we're doing our ranking factors data collection. This right. is just about helping marketers succeed. And I think that the purity of that mission has been something that's really helped the business uh, grow and earn the trust of our audience. And in turn, that's meant um, you know a great, funnel for us and uh, great subscriber growth um, and great revenue. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about uh, that because that is so relevant to professional services. That's exactly the same thing. It's a matter of demonstrating your expertise and building your trust and by helping people you really do both of those. So it's like uh, content marketing was designed for professional services. It works so well. There's no stretch there's nothing you have to, you know, make Sorry. it work like uh, you might in some industries. Nothing like that here. So uh, one of the things people ask sometimes is, will it help the firm if I develop a visible expert? In other words, the way you've helped your colleagues develop into their own visibility and their yeah. own expertise yeah. in that, does that help the firm or, uh, or does it merely just only stick to the person and not the firm? Um, I. I think that when you have only a single person who's responsible for that, and sometimes you know many professional services firms are built in, almost entirely around a founder, mm-hmm. right? And so that that's a fine model. But if you have folks who are working for you who are becoming those experts, uh, I think when you have one, there's a little bit more risk. But if you have multiples, uh, that can be, you know, a much a much safer and much more diverse. Um, scalable way to do it and it also it also reduces some of that risk yeah exactly